I'm back. Back in my homeland, Nigeria. For the first time in 10 years, the son of the soil is back home. The home I left a decade ago never to return. The home I left because of a traumatic experience that made me hate my beloved country. The traumatic experience was, and still is, that my father was politically assassinated and nothing has been done about that. Traffic in Lagos. So you can hear the horns blaring and you're saying, We're coming, get out of my way, please do not stand in my way, you crazy loon. Uh, the home I'm going to is where I spent my teenage years, but well, early part of my teenage years. I was born in the Baden, the city, yeah, this is the city I was born, but we were, my dad built this house. There's no place in the world like home. You can travel for like 21 million years, go to space, you gotta come home man. Um, yeah, a lot of that I just, I have returned. Oh my god, is she dead? There's somebody dead in the middle of the road. Oh my days. Did you see that? I saw a dead body on my first coming back and, and that to me that was just shocking. And life just goes on, man. Who's that woman? What happened to her? How come she ended up dead? Does anyone care? Does she have a family? Yes. And, and what's more shocking is like, oh yes, yeah, so dead bodies, people die every day, but on the, on the BTS road, and people just walking past the corpse. It's like, what kind of world, what kind of country is my country turning into? That is just shocking to me. And it, I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't left my system. But on the flip side, you know, again, to my mom, that's just, I don't think any words can actually... Um, I can't put words to that. I see you tomorrow. She's going home. There we go. I was so excited to see him back and um, I, I was really very happy, excited to have him back home. To You see, I'm supposed to be at work now. I had to take some time off to come and be with you guys because uh, I'm so happy he's around again. Awesome. Oh, I got oh, I got, I got, I got say hello to daddy. It's where my dad is buried. Hi dad, I'm home. Happy birthday on the 14th, Dad. I couldn't be home in time for that, but... Yeah. Balogun. It's, uh, it's actually should have been pronounced Oba Logun. Oba in Yoruba means the king. 
Ogun is war. So Balogun is a kind of war war lord. He worked at the then it was National Provident Fund. They now changed it to Nigerian Social Insurance Trust Fund. It was like an insurance company for the federal government. So they they had their headquarters in Abuja. So they, they normally go for management meetings. There was a transition from the military rule in 1998-99 then to the democratic government. So that means it's a, a turn of power. So the new government started to come in. And obviously when the new government starts to come in, they start to recruit people that are competent, that they feel they're competent, that can rule the, uh, run the, uh, the, the, the country. It was being touted, I believe, for a political office uh, in the sort of the financial sector. At this point in time, it was the sort of assistant general manager of one of the top um, insurance company in Nigeria that deals all the insurance for the government. And he was uh, second in command in there at that time. And so how did he die? How, how, how did I hear about his death? It was on a Monday morning, 1999, 26th, April. He was going to Abuja. And normally what he does is he goes to Abuja on a, on, a, on a Sunday or Monday morning. I think he was supposed to have gone by air, but maybe he was having a premonition or something and he went with his driver. It was like he was in a hurry to go. Then I ran and met him at the staircase and I said, what about food? I said, don't worry, then let me just go. Then <laughs> I peeped. <sighs> He drove off. Then about 40 minutes later or so, I just saw that the driver came back. And I asked, what happened? I said, where's daddy? And he said he had gone. And I was wondering how he could have gone. I said, how did he go? You brought back the car home, so how did he go? And he said he had gone by public transport. I mean, you guys have seen some of the state of the minivans, the minibuses on the road. Surely a man at the pinnacle of his career, as I mentioned, jumping on one of those is kind of insane, isn't it? He must be pretty much insane to leave a brand new car. And like, guess what, yes, I'm not going to take my brand new car. I'm just going to jump on one of these rickety old buses on a four hour journey. We had seven cars in the yard. We had five drivers. So I was wounded. I was wondering how he could have gone by public transport. Even as the wife, I could call any of the offices in Nigeria for them to send me a car and a driver. That was it. He went in a bus that I was told had 11 people. And of the 11 people, he was the only one. I'm sorry. He was the only one that died. So there's two sides to my dad's story. My dad's that death, there's the spiritual element of it, of uh, a voodoo element of his death. My mom would tell you, maybe my dad was acting suspicious prior to his death. And prior to his death, maybe a couple of years or a year, less than a year thereabout, he converted to Christianity, which means, oh my God, you can't do that. It's a taboo. I mean, I think it leaves much to be imagined and uh, you you will be tempted to think that it was kind of a voodoo or something. Uh, I was told he sat in the front of the bus, that there was a used copper in front with him, the driver was there. Then all others, there were two babies in the bus. Yeah, I mean, why would he be here alone? Hello, like, what kind of story is that? But no, no, it fits into the whole 
voodoo spiritual story, okay? Because somebody who's been cursed will do certain things. And when you're cursed, you do things that you normally won't do, okay? I don't know. I mean, it's a... Uh, I keep on racking my brain and uh, I seem not to be able to get an answer. I don't know. I don't know. That is one side of the story. But there was things that happened, yeah, before his death. There were things that I saw after his death that made me believe otherwise. I believe that my dad was politically assassinated. Shortly before he died, we were expecting something big either from his work or maybe a political appointment. He was supposed to get a promotion. And I think that if he had been given that Minister of Finance, which I was told he had been given, finance in Nigeria, like, I mean, the books got to be clean. I, I, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make, to change one of the, that stereotype of Nigeria has been a corrupt country. But we know that corruption takes place in Africa, within the African, anywhere in the world. Politicians are corrupt. Whether they from Europe or they're corrupt, they, do, they make laws that suit themselves. So I think he will have, been too difficult to handle my dad and I had to be getting rid of. And that whole story of him only only him dying in, in, in uh, him going to take minivan and I think this is all the setup. The driver told them that he saw diesel on the main road that he now tried to slam on the brake and they they, they said they trekked almost a kilometer to and fro and sideways and there was no diesel anywhere. So I said that must have been diesel from the pit of hell. Yeah, show me the evidence, show me documentation, show me the police report of the accident. Let me see the pictures of the, of the, of the, car, of the, of the van that was involved in the accident. Where's the driver? I need to speak to him. I, I wanted to meet him that time to actually ask him how it all happened. But you know, they, they always, all the drivers always have a union. So they felt maybe because uh, my husband died in the accident I was going to pull some trouble with him. So I never, I never got to meet him. There's no post-mortem reports. There's no police reports. There's no accidental files. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. And unfortunately, the people that we can ask are all kind of dead as well. So we're never going to know. I think that's the sad part of it. I know it's not easy, yeah. but if God will keep you, he'll be with you, you know you're under his Yeah. But life must go on, man. Life must go on, that's it. I was in church yesterday and that reminded me of why I'm still a Christian. With people who will probably have much more bigger problems than I have, just forgetting everything and just thanking God for just being alive. I think that's what I live on. Like, when things happen, don't let it get to you. Because if you allow it to get to you, it should be weighing you down. Keep moving on till you get there. Yeah. Don't let anything weigh you down. That is nothing you can't do, but just to get on with life. And that's even the hardest part of it, to get on with life without that person you love so much. Or in this case, somebody who's kind of supposed to be your mentor and your kind of protector, and kind of, kind of guide you through life to, 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 to be able to kind of your feet and then you just find out like, oh my God, I need to get on my feet now. I'm kind of 
I'm wobbling and waddling like, but I need to walk. Not only walk, I need to run. Run as fast as I can and possibly fly. But I'm, I don't know how to walk yet. What am I going to do? But I must walk. That thing that I needed help to do, I now must do without help. That's so hard. But that's reality at that point you're facing. You, there's nothing you can do. You just have to do it. So I'd like to encourage people who suffer traumatic experience in their life to kind of have faith, man. Because without faith, the faith is the substance of life. Without that hope that tomorrow will be better, that the people that you've lost will wish you so well, will want you to do exceptionally well. And as in my faith, in my in, in, in Christianity, we always believe something we are going to meet again. And just know that, you know, the spirit of the ones you've lost, just just always watches you, man. Hey, you know.